Dispersion staining is a method for optical staining of any transparent particle. The color appears at the edges of the particle due to refraction of light at the particle boundary. Here, a sample of olivine in 1.66 liquid is shown with a rotating polarizer. Every second, the vibration direction of the polarizer changes 180 degrees. Olivine is anisotropic, hence the particles show different colors due to their changing refractive indices as the plane of vibration of the light changes. Note that all olivine crystals show only colors in the visible spectrum. Any impurity will usually be easily detected by its different colors. As I scan the field of view, a number of non-olivine impurities come into view. One right here, for example. Another one here, opaque this time, no colors. If the particle and the liquid have different but intersecting dispersion curves, then no refraction will occur at that single wavelength. We call this lambda zero, the matching wavelength. Note that the liquid has a higher dispersion than the solid particle, hence on focusing above best focus, we should have two colored Becky lines. Here we see how the Becky lines are produced. This is the substage, the microscope, the preparation goes here, the particle is in, in this position so that its border is on the axis of the microscope. The light is refracted at that boundary so that we have red light coming into the particle and being refracted up into the objective where it hits an annular stop. With the annular stop, only this central lambda zero beam and neighboring wavelengths will pass through. All other wavelengths are stopped. We see then colored boundaries of the particle that match the lambda zero wavelength. We usually use a central stop, which gives us complementary colors. In other words, we have a small stop on the axis of the microscope that stops the lambda zero wavelength and its neighbors, near neighbors, and the other wavelengths then pass around the stop and come to a focus in the body tube of the microscope where they produce a complementary color for the borders of the particle. This is a dispersion staining color chart that we sometimes use, at least in the beginning, to determine what lambda zero is corresponding to the colors that we see in the crystals. The upper spectrum is the spectrum of colors for the annular stop, which of course we don't very often use anymore. The central stop colors are shown just below, and on each vertical line you see a pair of complementary colors. The biggest complication with dispersion staining is probably getting used to the idea of, of seeing green and thinking red or vice versa, or seeing blue and thinking yellow. Once you get over this small hurdle, it's no problem looking at colors, central stop colors, and writing down 530 nanometers, 465 nanometers, and you can expect to be accurate to plus or minus 10 nanometers with just a little bit of practice on known samples. Here we see our olivine crystals with annular stop. The particle boundaries are colored, and you should note the, a few of the particles, the green one, the blue one, the orange-red one in the upper left, and we'll see how they appear when we switch to the central stop. The field, of course, is bright with the annular stop, but will be black with the central stop. The colors we see for a given particle depend on the refractive indices of that particle 
its dispersion of index and the dispersion of index for the mounting liquid. If the particles were isotropic, they would show the same refractive index and the same dispersion staining color no matter how they are oriented relative to the polar. Here we see fluoride, calcium fluoride, in 1.430 liquid. I will start the rotating polarizer and you see there's some fluctuation in light intensity but there is no change in the color at the borders of the fluoride confirming its isotropic nature. We are now looking at a slide of tourmaline mounted in 1.630. The colors now change as the polar rotates indicating an anisotropic substance. The maximum change in color is a measure of the birefringence, about 0.02 for tourmaline. Note in addition that each particle shows the same color sometime during rotation of the stage. The color is a golden magenta, nearly magenta, and lambda zero is about 540 nanometers. This can only mean that tourmaline is uniaxial since only uniaxial crystals always show the same index during stage rotation for all randomly oriented uniaxial crystals. Not only that, but the index all tourmaline crystals show is omega, and the blue color otherwise indicates a lower refractive index, and therefore epsilon is less than omega, and the crystal is optically negative. Note in this field that one of the crystals shows very little change in color. It is therefore almost isotropic with a lambda zero near 460 nanometers. This signifies that we are almost looking parallel to the optic axis. I'll switch now to the 40x objective and the Bertrand lens and we will see what its interference figure looks like. So it's a fairly well-centered uniaxial cross. We may as well put in the red one plate. Yes, it's negative, just as we have already determined by dispersion staining. Let's see how a biaxial crystal behaves with dispersion staining. Olivine is a moderately birefringent biaxial crystal, and here we see it in 1.660 liquid. With the rotating polar, these olivine crystals show index and color variation, but no single color that all uniaxial crystals show during rotation of the polar, so it isn't uniaxial. Any crystal showing no color change will be a beta-beta view or an optic axis view. Most of the colors range from yellow to blue, but let's look for an optic axis view. It has to be one that shows no change in color, or at least a very small, here's one, a very slight change in color. This is going from a golden magenta to a pretty good magenta. And let's see what kind of an interference figure he shows. On my way to this figure, I could see that its retardation was quite low, consistent with an almost optic axis view. Here the optic axial angle is obviously fairly close to 90 degrees. The sign is positive. And if we rotate the stage, you can see how close to a centered figure we actually have. The other crystals are showing blues, magentas, and yellows, corresponding to indices close to alpha, beta, and gamma. If we look for the crystal showing the lowest lambda zero, the palest yellow, we would have the highest refractive index gamma. If we look for the palest blue, or pale blue green that we can find, that would correspond to alpha. And of course, the one 
that doesn't change color and stays magenta during rotation of the stage or the polar would be beta. We can determine all three refractive indices from the dispersion staining curves, which we will determine by mounting olivine in a succession of about four liquids and then determining the three indices by the intersection of those curves for alpha, beta, and gamma with the D-line of sodium. And we'll have the same numbers we would have gotten had we used the Becky line immersion method. Here is one example. I've remounted some olivine in liquid 164, liquid 1.640, a lower index we have just looked at. The colors now are all below magenta, that is lower lambda zero values. Some are pale yellow, some are almost white, and a few are as high as magenta, 560 nanometers. They will all have different lambda zero values then in this liquid, and the determination of those lambda zero values would be points on the dispersion staining curves for olivine. Incidentally, that large crystal in the lower part of the field is another optic axis view. It is showing lambda zero for beta in 1.640. Here then are the data points in the dispersion staining curves for olivine. I have just determined them using the rotating polarizer. It took about 35 minutes to mount the crystals in the different liquids to find the views showing each of the three refractive indices, alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha had the highest lambda zero. Beta had an intermediate lambda zero on the nearly isotropic crystals. And gamma had the lowest lambda zero. When I plotted those lambda zeros for each liquid and for each refractive index, I could then draw these dispersion staining curves. I then read the alpha N sub D refractive index on the intersection of the D line and the alpha dispersion staining curve. This turned out to be 1.644. Correspondingly, beta is 1.666 and gamma is 1.684. I know of no easier way and more rapid way to determine the refractive indices for a crystal than dispersion staining. Here we have plots of the data for the amphiboles and some of their associated minerals. Any substance for which such data are known can be quickly identified in mixtures by choosing an appropriate liquid from the dispersion staining data. The particle atlas has such data and the graf graphical plots for most of the common minerals. Based on the data just shown, we have selected three liquids for the identification of any of the asbestos minerals and their accompanying extraneous materials. This is chrysotile in 1.550 liquid, showing N perpendicular as blue and N parallel as magenta. This slide comes from a slide set that we produce to help teach students how to identify chrysotile and the other materials. This is tremolite, the non-fibrous form, mounted in 1605 liquid. This liquid is used for actinolite and thiophilite as well, and different colors will be obtained for each. This is anthophilite in the same liquid, 1605, and the two colors are a golden magenta and a yellow. This is amosite in 1680 liquid. The colors for N perpendicular are blue and for N parallel gold. 
we put chrysotile in the same liquid. And because it has higher indices, we get colors with lower lambda zeros in the yellow or golden magenta. Incidentally, we can determine the sign of elongation here. Since the lighter yellow is associated with a higher refractive index, a lower lambda zero, we can say that N perpendicular has a higher refractive index than N parallel. I know of no easier way to identify almost any materials, but certainly asbestos minerals can be identified very quickly and very aesthetically using dispersion staining. Here we see a talc sample with a low percentage of tremolite mounted in 1.605. All of the crystals you see, except that one lone ranger on the right, is fibrous talc. The blue to yellow crystal is tremolite. We use dispersion staining to identify minerals for rapid determination of the presence or absence of a given substance or for the rapid detection of traces of any given substance. Dispersion staining is a rapid technique for such problems and the rotating polar saves additional time. With this last look at olivine and 1.660, and a little bit above best focus. I hope I've given you a little bit of an idea of what dispersion staining can do for us. Thank you.